Hey guys, so let's jump in now to some more serious possible complications or things that can happen after a hypersensitivity disorder. So we're going to now talk about anaphylaxis. So this is probably, it was like, I'm trying to get this thing out of my way. This is probably the, you know, most serious or worst thing that could happen. Oh, here real quick. Let me do all my disclaimers. So this is a um, part of my new lectures that we have with the new textbook. Um, so this is breaking stuff down in a little bit of a different way. I'm trying a little bit of a different approach. It has some interactive stuff sometimes throughout um, this. Um, instead of having one long lecture, I'm kind of breaking it down by topics and things like that. So um, hopefully this will help you. So this section is going to focus on anaphylaxis. It is going to have some meds like bronchodilators in there. We're also going to talk about oxygen therapy too. So um, hopefully this helps. Anyway, so let's jump in. So the last video, um, you know, these are always more helpful if you kind of watch them in order, they make more sense because they lead off of each other. But if you're just starting with me, we're talking about, um, you know, any sort of hypersensitivity disorder. And so we're at the point now, you know, we've talked about allergic rhinitis. We've talked about like local skin reactions when it comes to having hypersensitivity disorder. And then we've also talked about angioedema or, you know, the swelling to the face, the lips and things like that. So the next step, what can happen is we can have a systemic reaction. And just as a reminder for those that maybe are just starting on this video, hypersensitivity disorders are where the body is overreacting. Um, now, sometimes again, this can happen locally in one area like the nose, it can happen on the skin, it can happen just certain parts of the face or the airway. Um, it can also be systemic. And so what happens with anaphylaxis is the immune system is overreacting, but it spreads to the bloodstream um, or it starts to spread so much that it leads to very serious problems. So the, the two main problems that we have with anaphylaxis that happens is, is a closing and an opening. There's a closure of the airway or airway obstructions. Usually this is as a result of swelling. There's so much swelling um, in the airway to the point where it's closed and air cannot get in. There's no oxygenation um, able to happen. Um, but the other problem that can happen is it can lead to a systemic shock or an opening or dilation of blood vessels. So to better understand this, you just have to think about, you know, what happens when the immune system is reacting or overreacting. Um, when the body thinks there is something inside of it that is not supposed to be there, that is attacking it, that is causing a problem, what it does is it starts to um, try to protect itself. So it protects itself by trying to get all of its fighters in. It gets its fighters in by opening up um, all the doors in the blood vessels. So this vasodilation or this opening, this happens as a result of the body trying to get all of its fighters to come help because it senses there's this big, you know, um, you know, battle about to go down, even though they're like the body again is overreacting to something it doesn't need to react to. In its mind, it thinks that there's something that is about to go down. So it is opening all of its doors, getting all of its best fighters in. And then a lot of those, um, you know, um, like allergy complex complexes and things, these spiders that are coming in, they lead to swelling and things like that. They lead to, especially in the airway, they can lead to closure of the airway. So pretty much um, the doors are all opening um, in the blood vessels, which is leading to this massive vasodilation. Um, and then also there's swelling from all these particles that are being released. There's swelling that can happen, especially it's most dangerous, of course, in the airway. Um, now, someone can have anaphylaxis and not necessarily go into shock and have the hypotension, um, but um, we always like to think worst case scenario. So if someone's, an, just because someone has anaphylaxis doesn't mean they're an anaphylactic shock. So I do want to, you know, just make this um, clear that anaphylaxis is really just about this systemic reaction. All this systemic reaction could just be that my airway is starting to close, um, but it also could include the shock portion, which is where, um, you know, I get so vasodilated to the point my body can't compensate and I go into full shock. Um, so the big, you know, so what here is it can lead to complete respiratory failure and, you know, complete collapse of your ability to, you know, defend yourself or to compensate for this really, really low blood pressure, which of course can lead to shock and death. Da, 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 da. All right, let's go on. So what are the hallmark symptoms here? Um, 
some of the hallmark symptoms of anaphylaxis, and this is the um, picture from uh, the textbook, the, some of the hallmarks here are going to be, um, you know, other signs, because usually like it's not just that, you know, person um, starts with anaphylaxis, usually they're going to have symptoms or things elsewhere, because a lot of times, again, it's a spreading. Um, now, it can spread very quickly. Anaphylaxis can happen super quick, like within, um, you know, uh, you know, seconds to minutes, um, you know, it can happen super quick, but um, it can also um, build up over time. Time. So you may notice other signs of allergic reaction like hives. Um, you may notice some of the angioedema swelling in the lips, um, which is why when someone has angioedema, we're keeping such a close eye and making sure they're not progressing here. Um, but things are getting more systemic and deeper into the lower airway. So you're going to notice some respiratory symptoms. Um, you know, think of a person who's breathing really fast because um, they have this very narrow passage. So just like the beautiful, beautiful heart um, starts to beat faster in order to compensate when um, there's not enough blood flow. Same with the respiratory system. When there's not enough oxygen going in, it starts, your body naturally starts to breathe faster to try to help to get more, um, you know, oxygenation and ventilation going on. Um, the patient, you may notice they have a hoarse sounding voice. They may be hard to understand. They can have, um, you know, lung sounds of wheezing. Um, you especially, you know, like a very common or one of those like, you know, kind of like, you know, hallmark signs we think of it as strider. So wheezing is something that's going on in my lower airways that I, I can hear with my stethoscope or strider is something I usually hear just listening to them where it's like, <gasps> you know, it's, it's upper airway. So strider is higher. Um, where wheezing is lower. Um, so wheezing is something I hear with my steth uh, stethoscope. Now, some people, their wheezing gets pretty intense and you can even hear it when they're, you know, just sitting there, um, you know, and breathing, you can hear the wheezing. Um, but most of the time, strider upper airway, it's more of like a high pitch, like a kind of sound like a crowing sound. Um, whereas wheezing is more of something I hear with my stethoscope, um, lower airways. Um, they may complain of shortness of breath. Um, you know, they might also have signs that, um, you know, the cardiovascular signs, because this is a respiratory, remember respiratory is closing, cardiovascular is opening. And when I say opening, I mean dilating. Um, so, you know, and again, we, we talked about this in uh, other videos, but um, our cardiovascular system, we definitely want, don't want our blood vessels too constricted, but we also don't want them to open because if they're too open, that can lead to, um, you know, complete inability for the uh, body to be able to um, get blood where it needs to go. The blood vessels need at least so much squeeze to get blood moving forward. So they need, you know, just the right amount. They don't need to be too closed, but not too open either. Um, but on top of, you know, maybe having this hoarseness, this um, upper airway kind of, <gasps> I can't even do it. I can't even do it. This is, I'm so bad. I can't even fake anaphylaxis. Like I really need to work on my game here. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, maybe I need to prepare more for this. So, you know, I got to practice my, uh, my strider sounds, but you get it. It's like upper airway crowing. So they might be short of breath, like real hoarse uh, um, in their voice. Um, but they also might have low blood pressure. Now they're not going to sit there and be like, Hey, my blood pressure is low. So you want to think of, you know, if you're on a nursing school exam, what is a patient going to complain about? They might complain of dizziness, um, you know, lightheadedness, especially with changing positions. Um, and they can also feel like their heart is racing because the body compensates when my blood pressure is low. Again, just like with my respiratory rate that increases, my heart rate also increases to compensate. And my heart is so smart. It thinks, hey, if I pump faster, I'll get more blood out. But again, the problem here is it's not that there's not fluid in the body. It's just that everything's vasodilated. So a lot of that fluid has shifted out to my tissues or my cells. And so it's not where it's supposed to be. So the body thinks there's less fluid. So it's trying to pump faster and faster to get that perfusion out to my organs. Um, you can see there's some other symptoms here, but really think about these hallmarks, you know, what people are most often going to complain about or have. So what are my priority nursing assessments? Um, you know, most of these, you know, you want to think ABCs, especially thinking about that airway. So um, one second, sorry, this Zoom thing. Ah! All right, let's see if I can get it moving out of the way. One second. Uh, can I hide this? Hide video panel. No, didn't work. No, let's say show video panel. Hide floating meeting control. There we go. All right, perfect. Got it out of the way. Um, but now how do I get back? <laughs> okay, it says press escape. All right, cool. Anyway, um, just making sure I'm not a, a Zoom goddess by any means. So anyway, so uh, my priority nursing assessments are going to be, um, you know, my ABCs, especially everything with anaphylaxis. Think that A and anaphylaxis is all about airway. 
Um, I want to make sure the airway is patent. And so majority of the time, these patients, especially if they're having a true anaphylactic reaction, they're going to end up intubated um, or need an advanced airway because um, even if their airway is remaining open for now, sometimes it's such a high chance that it's going to close. We don't want to wait till it's so close that we can't get a breathing tube in. Um, so a lot of times we intubate early in these patients so that we make sure that we have a way to get oxygen in this patient um, until their airway um, swelling goes down. Um, so we're going to obviously look for swelling, listen for those sounds that there's a closed airway or a, closure, a closing airway, I should say. Um, we're going to look at their breathing, accessory muscles, work of breathing, respiratory rate. Um, we're going to look for signs of poor or adequate oxygenation. So um, if someone is not oxygenating well, a late sign would be cyanosis. If someone's blue, um, it's not an early sign, except when we talk about certain disease processes, but this is not one of them. So if they're cyanotic, you're in trouble, or I shouldn't say you're in trouble, but that patient's in trouble and um, definitely something's not working out well. Usually we're going to see early on a change in, um, you know, uh, you know, we're going to see the respiratory rate increasing first. And then, um, you know, as they're really starting to decrease, uh, sorry, respiratory rate increasing, and then maybe they're complaining of shortness of breath. And then as time goes on, their oxygen saturation is going to go down and then they can turn blue. But again, hopefully we're taking care of things before they're turning blue. Um, circulation wise, we're going to watch their blood pressure, their heart rate, and keep an eye on that. And then, you know, one of the best measures of overall circulation or perfusion in the body is going to be, um, mental status because the brain, it needs absolutely like drives and lives off of good blood flow. So if I don't have good blood flow, a lot of times one of the early signs is going to be that I'm, I'm getting confused. Um, I'm not as awake as I usually am, et cetera. So those are some, uh, priority assessments you want to look at. So how do we know a patient with anaphylaxis is getting better? So a patient with anaphylaxis that's getting better would be showing signs. Again, we want to look at respiratory and we want to look at cardiovascular. Um, and again, not everyone is going to have um, issues with both. They might only have respiratory issues. Um, they're not going to just have cardiovascular issues, but in other words, everyone with anaphylaxis is going to have some sort of respiratory issue going on. I and mean, that's always going to be my priority, but some of them may have progressed to where they have the cardiovascular or um, shock involvement. So, uh, but we definitely want to always keep an eye because again, um, it can happen at any time. So um, respiratory wise, we're going to look for decreased swelling in their airway and their face, depending on where this maybe if it's in their lips, their, um, uh, what do you call them, um, their tongue, stuff like that. Um, so decreasing shortness of breath, maybe they're showing improvement in their oxygenation, their respiratory rates going down. Um, and then of course we want their blood pressure to be going up and their heart rate to be going down, kind of showing it's getting back to baseline. So pretty much everything going back to what it's supposed to be respiratory and cardiovascular wise. How do we know they're getting worse? Well, we know they're getting worse if the patient becomes unconscious. If you're to the point where your body is like, you know, kind of think of it on a really like crazy party night out, not that you guys are crazy part, uh, crazy party animals, uh, as well. I can't even talk anymore. Um, but uh, what do you call it? Um, I'm just kidding with y'all. I know I'm sure that um, many of you have imbibed at some point and gotten to the point where your body just like, nope, that's too much alcohol. So it's the same kind of thing when it comes to oxygenation as well. If your body's not getting enough oxygen, it's like, well, yeah, I can't operate without that oxygen. So it just turns off. Um, and so you can become unconscious. Um, and so uh, that's definitely a sign like, hey, we need to do something right away. Um, if the respiratory symptoms are getting worse, so you would look for worsening shortness of breath, um, work of breathing. So look at the accessory muscles and remember your accessory muscles are the muscles that you use to breathe your nose. Um, uh, you can have nasal flaring. Um, you look in your clavicle area, you look, um, you know, a lot of times they, they call it, um, uh, what's intra is it intracavicular retractions or it's, uh, what do you call them? It's some sort of clavicular retraction. So, but, um, you know, look on an exam, you're going to look for things that are, um, anytime you see the word retractions, that's a sign of increased work of breathing or it's a bad sign. So we do not want to retract. Retraction means that it's kind of like a sucking in that like, <gasps> like when you take it, like take a really deep breath 
and um, if you, I'm not going to do this because I'm obviously not going to take my shirt off for um, this live camera, but you could do this in the privacy of your own home for fun. Um, take your shirt off and like look in the mirror and um, if take a really like sharp, deep breath and you're going to kind of see like a sucking in of your um, skin uh, going in, uh, what do you call it around, especially around your clavicles and stuff like that. Um, so intercostal retractions is another one there I came up with. I knew it was going to come up eventually. I was like, I have these in my head. They're just Today they're floating around and uh, I'm on, uh, you know, winter breaks. So I've got winter break head where, uh, you know, uh, the drive to, to need to get work done, but also really want to relax. So I know y'all can feel me on that. Um, so anyway, so you're going to look for intercostal retractions. Um, uh, what do you call it? Um, the, you know, you're going to look for retractions around your clavicle area, um, you know, around your shoulders. Um, and then um, also you want to look for abdominal um, or belly breathing, abdominal retractions or abdominal breathing, um, things like that. So what I was getting at is, is that um, you're going to be having changes to your breathing, maybe in your nose, nasal flaring, going to look around your, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, clavicular area and around your shoulders for any sort of retractions. You're going to look around your rib cage for retractions and then look for belly breathing as well. Um, I always tell people, if you're ever not sure on an exam, um, you know, like really just like sit there because you're probably already stressed out anyway and take some and see what happens. Like if you're working really hard, which of your muscles are you using? Um, they might have signs of worsening oxygenation, decreased oxygen saturation and abnormal ABG, which ABG is coming soon. Don't worry, um, which I already have a ton of videos, but I mean, like my new ABG video is coming soon. So I know y'all love ABG videos. Um, so also then um, cardiovascular symptoms could be getting worse, like their blood pressure could be going even lower, their heart rate's going up, or they could go into complete cardiac arrest. I don't have it on here, but also dysrhythmias could be a sign that um, things are getting worse because um, the heart is very sensitive. If you're not getting good oxygenation, um, you can end up with, um, I was going to say, um, dysryth like hypoxic dysrhythmias, mm, which sounds so beautiful, right? Um, so what do, what, what do we do to medically manage this? This is obviously something that as the nurse, um, you know, there's things I can do to comfort and make this patient a little bit better, but they need something because I cannot reopen their airway. So what do they need? So my priority A for anaphylaxis is airway. So I'm going to keep a patent airway. We're going to, um, our first line drug, um, that this is one of those few times that I can succinctly say that, you know, for anaphylaxis, my first line drug, and of course in my head, my head saying, well, maybe, you know, but uh, I, I would find it very hard on an exam if it said, you know, patients in anaphylaxis or anaphylax, uh, you know, that they're like full on anaphylaxis, the first drug should always be epinephrine. Now, if you have an exam that doesn't have epinephrine as an option, one of these other ones might be your option, but epinephrine really should be first. Um, so usually we start with epinephrine um, to open the airway because here's the thing, the rest of these drugs can work. We can decrease the swelling. Um, we can decrease the alert response. We can give oxygen, et cetera, but none of it's going to matter if my airway is closed. So first we have to start by opening the airway. So epinephrine, um, <clears throat> we're going to do this. They may need repeated doses. Um, we also use things like albuterol, which is a short acting beta agonist. I'll talk about it here soon. It helps to open the airway even more. You cannot do albuterol alone. It's not going to be sufficient when they're in a state of anaphylaxis. They have to have epinephrine. Um, we also want to treat the problem. Um, so we want to remove any of the offending agents. So I think I talk about in my other video, there's a nurse that I worked with that was allergic to the type of gloves, nitrile gloves. And so she brought her own gloves, but someone was reaching over her in a, you know, a difficult situation and touched her with their gloves. And she went on to full anaphylaxis. So like the big thing was, you know, making sure that whatever was, um, you know, you know, causing that reaction was not still touching her. Um, uh, diphenhydramine or Benadryl, which we've talked about in my other video. Now, keep in mind, airway closed. So I'm not giving anything oral. So these are all IV. Um, so we're going to decrease the allergy response with the diphenhydramine or Benadryl IV. Um, we're also going to give steroids IV to decrease allergic reaction, reduce swelling. Um, they might also receive some steroids, um, you know, inhal inhaled treatment as well, but, um, you know, it just kind of depends on the patient, but they may need systemic steroids since this is a systemic problem as well. Um, adequate oxygenation. So we're going to do things like um, high flow oxygen. Um, you know, the, the thing is, is again, like I can give all the oxygen in the world because it seems like this is an oxygen problem, but this is an airway problem. So the airway has to be open first. I can shove all the oxygen I want, but if my, like, think of like, 
um, you know, trying to, um, what do you call it, um, pour something into a funnel, but the funnel is closed. Like there's nothing that you can pour into that. Um, if there's a block, so think of it almost like a hose that literally has like a kink in it. There's nothing that's going to flow through that. So first we have to undo the kink and then we can actually get oxygen flowing. Um, they may need intubation, like I said, and then circulation is going to come last because we always do ABCs, you know, and so circulation is going to come last, um, but it's still very important. It's not when I say last, it's like we're doing all these things at the same time, but um, epinephrine definitely needs to be at the top of your list. When it comes to the other things, it's not like I'm, I'm not putting these in order. I'm not saying, okay, we're going to do epinephrine, then we're going to do albuterol, then diphenhydramine, because really after epinephrine, um, it, it, I would find it very hard to say which of these you need to do first. Now, of course, steroids are stronger than diphenhydramine, albuterol is important and all this stuff and oxygen is super important, but I, I couldn't really, at least me as an instructor, I wouldn't feel good about putting this on an exam because really they might need all of these things. They might need some of these things. It's doctor preference. So the, really the thing I want you to focus on is don't look at these as being in order when it comes to like the this actual PowerPoint slide, but definitely no epinephrine has to come first. The rest of the thing. It's just going to depend on the physician, what they want. Um, but here's some of the things we might use. I'll tell you for sure they're going to get epinephrine. They're probably going to get albuterol. They may or may not get diphenhydramine. They'll probably get steroids. They're definitely 100% going to get oxygen. All these patients are going to be on oxygen. Um, and then, like I said, if they have a circulation problem, then they may need, um, you know, IV fluids. The IV fluids serve two purposes. So one, their blood pressure is low. So it helps to do, uh, helps with that. But also in their bloodstream, you know, they're having this systemic reaction. There's all these um, allergy particles in their bloodstream um, that are floating around. Um, and so anytime we have too much of a certain type of particle, what we need to do is we need to dilute it. So this helps to bring their blood pressure up, but it also helps to um, dilute some of those excess allergy particles, which will help hopefully decrease some of the reaction, get them flushed out and um, get back to a stable state. Um, no, for these patients, it's, it's very confusing sometimes for students when they think about this. So um, we usually don't talk too much about shock at a med surge level, but something you should know about shock is, is that when a patient's in shock, um, you know, a lot of times you would think with the thing with like with a issue like this anaphylaxis, I want their head of bed elevated because it's an airway breathing problem. So yes, I do want their head of bed elevated, but if they're incredibly hypotensive, just know that we usually like to lie them flat and elevate their legs because this helps. Like if you think about it, if like this is my legs and this is my head, if I have my legs elevated and I have a low fluid problem or a hypotension problem, then the fluid from my legs is going to um, more easily have less resistance to reach my heart if I have the legs elevated head of bed flat versus if I have um, my head of bed elevated, my, uh, my circulatory system has to overcome a lot of resistance to get blood back to my heart. So no, in general, with these anaphylactic patients, most of the time their head of bed is going to be up. They're intubated. We keep their head of bed at 30 degrees. Now I'm not doing no 90 degrees, getting crazy with them. Um, but I'm going to keep their head a bit elevated. Now, some of these patients, there might be times that their blood pressure is super low and they're in shock. Um, we may have to put their head of bed flat in order and may elevate their legs in order to help to support them. So just know in general, it's only if they're really severely hypotensive. Usually we want these patients head of bed elevated. So let's talk about albuterol. Um, so albuterol helps to open the airway. Um, what do you call it? Very fast. So this is a rescue medication. I'm going to refer to this a lot in later PowerPoints and stuff like that. Cause I kind of um, use this as like a way, especially when we talk about diabetes, we talk about fast acting insulins. Um, and then the more long acting insulins, it's really helpful to know, like, when am I going to use this med albuterol? We're going to talk about this a lot in my lower respiratory PowerPoint that's coming soon. Um, that um, albuterol is all, it's a rescue. It helps to open my airway um, and it can be used in emergencies. Like when people are having asthma attacks, things like that. It also just helps to open the airway in general. I um, mean, you know, for people with chronic issues, I can use it before um, I exercise that my airway is nice and open, um, you know, things like that, especially if I had like exercise induced asthma, um, things like that. So it can be used in a lot of things. Now I said, we use it in anaphylaxis just to help kind of keep the airway more open, but it's not a rescue for me. And, um, it's a rescue for asthma. It helps to rescue a lot of times and improves things in COPD as well. 
Um, but um, people in general, you'll see this in the hospital, a lot of times, you know, patients having a breathing issue and the first go-to is going to be like, hey, let's order albuterol. Um, hold on one second. Let's see here. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, so the big picture here is, is that, um, you know, a lot of times albuterol seem like the thing that's going to fix everything and it's not, it's, it's not really, it's not the fix for everything, you know, but you'll see albuterol ordered a lot in a lot of different ways and things like that when it comes to, um, uh, in the hospital. So this is a med like out of like a lot of meds to know, like this is definitely one you want to know for practice. You'll see it on tests a lot for a variety of conditions, but usually this is used for conditions that have closure or narrow airway. It's also known as like, um, like restrictive airway disorders, things like that. Um, so, um, you know, albuterol, we're going to talk about it more uh, later when we talk about like asthma, COPD, um, but it can be used in anaphylaxis, like I said, just kind of um, synergistically with some other meds. But remember, this is not my first med. It does help open the airway, but does not help open the airway the same way that epinephrine does. Um, and so um, we definitely need epinephrine first and then albuterol. But you'll see in other conditions, I'll talk about how you want to do albuterol first, but yes, not in anaphylaxis. So, yes. Um, so anyway, so these are also known as short acting beta two agonists or SABAs. Um, here's some, uh, drug uh, mnemonics and things for you that might help. Um, you know, they all end in OL, um, like albuterol, leva albuterol. Um, like I say here, you can use them prior to exercise. If you're having wheezing, um, you know, we'll talk about decreased peak flow volumes that has to do with asthma. Um, that's another time to use them. And then with any respiratory difficulties, like shortness of breath, decreasing oxygen. All right. So some considerations we will know that it's worked. Um, if they have less wheezing, less shortness of breath or better oxygen saturation as a whole, those should be feel like they're breathing easier. Um, they should have signs of um, good oxygenation ventilation. Um, we'll know there's a problem if they have, you know, increased heart rate. Um, so a lot of times, you know, patients already like, you know, they're not breathing well. Like if they're in, like we talked about with anaphylaxis, they might already have tachycardia. So we usually don't give this if their heart rate is greater than 120 because it it is a, um, it, it works in the beta system, which can affect the heart as well. So it can increase the heart rate. Um, a lot of times the things that people complain of the most is like a feeling of anxiety or restlessness after taking their albuterol. So we do take that into consideration. Um, but again, it's just kind of risk versus benefit. Um, but we're going to look at their heart rate. They also could have hypertension with this because this does do kind of like a fight or flight kind of reaction in the body. And then they also might have dysrhythmias. And so we want to ask about palpitations, look for EKG changes. We do want to tell them to that they may have anxiety or they may experience tremors. Again, this is like the fight or flight, like when your body is, um, it, it's helpful when it's supposed to be there. <laughs> but um, a lot of times I've after taking this med, it can be uncomfortable. Some of the other off brands of albuterol uh, for that people have to take this chronic uh, pe for people that have to take this chronically, um, there are some that have less of this symptom. Um, it just kind of depends, but just know kind of we're watching their vital signs, blood pressure, heart rate. We're going to be checking their EKG, etc. Um, some special things to keep in mind is you know it may not be appropriate for patients with certain cardiac disorders because of those infects. We, they need to know how to use an inhaler properly. Now, when they're in the hospital, they're usually going to get it with a mask or otherwise, but um, if they're going to be taking this at home, and that would be more for asthma COPD versus um, for a patient with anaphylaxis, but they do need to know how to use this. They need to know when they're supposed to take it, and um, they should they should take this medication, but if they're using it a lot, you know, they need to go get some help. So it is not seen as a good thing if a patient needs a lot of albuterol. Like if a patient came in and is like, hey, I've been using my albuterol more. I'm not going to be like, oh, wow, great. They're so compliant. I'm going to start saying like, why are they needing to be rescued all the time? This is a rescue med. So if they're having to use it a lot, especially when we start talking about like asthma, COPD, like that's not a good thing. Um, so, or if, if you have a patient who is requesting their albuterol a lot after with their anaphylaxis, or, you know, they're needing a bunch of treatments or they're wheezing um, over and over and over again, um, this is not, this is a rescue med, but it's not meant to constantly rescue. There's something else that's not working. 
Um, there's also, like I mentioned, inhaled corticosteroids. Um, these help two ways. They help to increase inflammation directly um, in my airways or open my airway um, if there's inflammation in the airway itself. But it also helps to suppress the immune system or stop the body from reacting so much. Now, um, you know, the inhaled ones definitely work more directly, um, but they can also help with that overreaction. So a lot of people, um, you know, when I, we talk about this, use using this for like asthma, C OPD, um, you know, they use this a lot so they don't react so much. Because again, um, especially when we talk about like um, asthma, which is a type of hypersensitivity disorder, um, you know, we really, we want them to, you know, obviously have an open airway first and foremost, but we also don't want them to keep having this airway that's closing. So we're trying to look at the big picture, like how can we get to the bottom of the problem? Um, these can work fairly quickly but this is not my first medication. And so steroids take a little bit to start working. So I'm not gonna use these first. Um, so usually again, like we're always gonna start with our epinephrine for anaphylaxis, our butyrol is pretty high up there cause it works very quick. And then we, we are gonna use steroids but it's usually not gonna be like, oh my God, get the steroid stat. You know, um, it, we, we're gonna use them pretty early on but not the first med. Um, remember, uh, for because we talked about steroids for um, other disorders and things like that for the respiratory system, that all, um, like we talked about nasal corticosteroids, um, but um, the mnemonic to remember these is they all end in owner eye, because remember it helps inflammation hide. Uh, we know that, that this has worked because they might have decreased wheezing, decreased shortness of breath, better oxygen saturations. They might also just be have less attacks or they're having um, less frequency of a problem with this. Um, you know, the only problem that you can, that might happen with this is that, especially if it's not given right, um, administered correctly, or just because sometimes it does happen is they can get an opportunistic infection or get thrush in their mouth. Um, that would look like white patchy lesions on their tongue. Um, so, you know, as a whole with this, um, you know, just keep in mind, like this medication suppresses immune system. We talked about this, that it's possible could happen in the nose too, with the nasal spray for nasal corticosteroids, um, but very rare, but it happens more often in the mouth. Um, it's just a breeding ground for infection already. And then with things like inhaled corticosteroids, um, they're suppressing your immune system, which puts you at risk for those opportunistic infections. Um, so special instructions in teaching, like, you know, in general, we always use albuterol before steroids because, um, you know, um, albuterol again is going to be my rescue where steroids are going to help, but they're not going to be the first one um, to make the big difference. We want to use a spacer and I'll talk about that on my next slide, what a spacer is, but it helps to allow for better medication administration. And then we need to um, rinse their mouth after we use it to help to decrease the risk of that thrush as well. So some inhaler teaching, um, there's a couple different types of inhalers. There's what's known as a meter dose inhaler, which is this one, oh, I don't know which one, if you could see my cursor, but it's this one here at the bottom with the canister and everything here, this is a MDI. So people, this is not necessarily what you're gonna see in the hospital as often. Sometimes you're gonna see these, but um, not as often. They usually again, come and give treatments through, um, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it, masks and things like that. Um, but a meter dose inhaler is something they would have at their house or um, so it, what it has. Uh, what's the difference here is, is that um, with these, there's a meter dose inhaler, there's a DPI or dry powdered inhaler. And the difference really comes in, do you shake it or not? And how, um, how do you use it? Like how fast do you breathe the medication in? For a meter dose inhaler, you always have to shake it before use. And you want to breathe that medication in slowly. You're going to wait a minute between puffs and um, always rinse the mouthpiece, do good oral care with that. And we'll, we prefer spacer, especially with that one. Whereas a dry powder inhaler, it's like this disc here. Here. It's a circular disc. And so with this, there's going to be no shaking with this one. So do not shake a DPI. And these are usually more ones you're going to see like long acting medications in these versus the um, MDI is usually for your short acting. And then for the DPI, you want to breathe in very quickly. So, um, you know, usually with these, what you do is you do like, you know, um, you do, do a big exhale. And then with the DPI, you're going to like real quick, whereas the meter dose is like, 
you're going to try to like take as deep of a breath in. Usually you try to take a deep breath in for like 10 seconds. Um, so a spacer is a, a device that goes on in between this like end of this mouthpiece here. And it's this big long tube. And what it does is, is that if you put that in between you and your mouth, instead of the medication going right on your tongue, it helps you to actually better inhale the medication over time, especially for those that maybe can't coordinate real well and get that, you know, like exhale and then good inhale, you know, and things like that. So it helps for medication not being um, lost in the mouth and the air and allows you to inhale slower as well. I usually show a video here of how to use a meter dose inhaler, um, but obviously I'm not going to show this for copyright other reasons um, on this. Oh, there we go. let's keep going. So um, let's do a real quick stopping point here to look at some prescriptions we might have for anaphylaxis. So this is a really common next generation kind of question. So, um, you know, for a question like this, you might have this as a next generation kind of question on NCLEX or on your exams. And what it's really um, asking for here is for each of these orders, are they appropriate? Is it good? Um, is it contraindicated or is it bad or is it unnecessary? In other words, and most like, you know, most students can get appropriate or contraindicated, but unnecessary. Sometimes students are like, I don't know if it's necessary or not, but this is really helpful as a nurse too, because sometimes, you know, doctors can order things and it may not be necessary. Um, you know, even if it's not necessarily contraindicated or harmful for the patient, um, it's not really needed. So in other words, you want to think about, um, you know, this is a question that really helps to assess, is this, a uh, uh, is this a medication or treatment, or we call them prescriptions. By the way, anytime you see the word prescriptions, it's the same word for order. Um, but, you know, a prescription doesn't have to be a medication. It can also be like uh, orders for ambulation or something like that. Um, so prescription is the word NCLEX uses for any order from a physician. Um, so you need to write whether it is appropriate. In other words, this is something that I want and that will help to make this patient better. It's contraindicated or cause, cause harm. Um, or make things worse for this patient or unnecessary that it's not, it's not going to help advance the patient's care for this diagnosis. So we want to see which of these are appropriate. So normal saline, 150 mils per hour continuous. So, um, you know, that would be appropriate, especially if they're in anaphylactic shock. So there's nothing I can see where that would be contraindicated or cause harm to the patient or where it would be unnecessary. So um, we talked about how they have a respiratory problem and then a cardiovascular problem. So this helps with the cardiovascular one or the circulation issue. Head of bed elevated. So, you know, I was back and forth about putting this one on because I know I went through that whole thing where I was like, well, it depends on if they're in shock or not. Um, for most of these patients, head of bed elevated is a appropriate. Um, it is a appropriate because um, it allows for um, them to be able to uh, get good oxygenation. Now, we don't want that elevated too, too crazy high, but we do like it elevated. There's no contraindication to this, and it is not unnecessary. Ooh, now that we got a medication here, bedosinide nebulizer. Okay, so first step is like, you know, like, let's see, I, can I figure out what this med is? So it ends in IDE. So own and ide, if you remember, help what hide? Inflammation. So yes, yeah, so this is a steroid. Um, nebulizer. And so, um, you know, we want to think about whether this is appropriate, contraindicated, or unnecessary. So, um, you know, it's a steroid nebulizer, in other words, a, a breathing treatment. Um, I think that would be necessary. So it's not unnecessary. I don't see how it would harm the patient. So I'm going to go with A, appropriate. Um, all right, the next one says oxygen protocol titrate to obtain SpO2 greater than 95%. Okay, so this is like oxygen protocol is just where they want you to, um, you know, you place whatever oxygen device is needed in order to keep my oxygen levels at 95% or higher. So looking at this, I have to think about for anaphylaxis, is it an oxygen problem? Do they need oxygen? Well, it's an airway problem, but in order to get better, they do need good oxygenation. Like I said, all, these patients are one way or another. I've never seen a patient with anaphylaxis that was not on some sort of oxygen therapy. So, and this makes sense. I know I always have to make sure the whole answer is right. So I do like that in, uh, O2 above 95%. In real life, we only really care about it being above 90, but in nursing school, everything is a little bit, uh, a little bit more extreme. So above 95 for sure. Um, all right. So I'm so far, I've said it's appropriate for normal saline, appropriate for head of bed elevated, appropriate for the steroid inhaler, and also appropriate for the oxygen therapy.
So let's keep going on. So now we're gonna look at flutoxone nasal spray. So again, we have this own, like the eyed. So I'm sitting here and I'm like, okay, so this is a um, anti-inflammatory or a steroid, um, but it's a nasal spray. So now I need to sit there and look at this, like, okay, it's a nasal spray. Um, is like, so I like the steroid part of it because I, I know that I wanna use steroids, but is a nasal spray what's appropriate here? So I have to sit here and think and say, hmm, like, okay, what's most appropriate? Um, so, you know, with this, um, you know, I want to say like, okay, is, you know, it, it's not, I wouldn't say it's contraindicated, like it's not going to necessarily cause harm, but is it actually going to help the patient? Is there a problem here in their nose? And it's not really a flucotazone nasal spray, um, would be appropriate for someone with like allergic rhinitis, but it's not going to help someone with anaphylaxis. I'm not going to be sitting there. Someone's like their airways closing quick, get the nasal spray. Like, you know, like it's not going to help this patient. So, um, you know, this was one, one I would say is you for unnecessary. It's, it's not that it's going to harm the patient, but how is it really helping them? Because the problem isn't here in their nose. It's a systemic problem. The next one is calamine lotion. Okay, so it's anaphylaxis. We talked about calamine lotion when we talked about like topical um, issues. Like, and so, you know, you could maybe in your head want to argue like calamine lotion. Okay, this is hypersensitivity. Of course, this is appropriate. But again, you know, is the problem with anaphylaxis on the skin? Now, can they have a part, part of their skin maybe reacting? Absolutely. But this is a systemic issue. And so doing the local calamine lotion is not actually going to treat the airway breathing circulation issue that's going on here. When we think anaphylaxis, we're really thinking of, and when you think about these prescriptions, think of how we're going to treat our ABCs. Um, so, you know, there might be other treatments and stuff like that, that might need to be used to treat their symptoms and their, you know, uncomfortable stuff that might go on. But, um, you know, it's, it's, this is not going to harm the patient to put calamine lotion on, but it's not really necessary. So again, this is kind of like the last one. It's not really going to get to the depth of the problem because I can put calamine lotion all day long. They're going to itch less, but it's not going to stop them from reacting the way that they are. And it's not going to really get to the bottom of the problem. Okay, so now we have diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl IV push. So with a question like, or like a choice like this, we want to look at, okay, um, this is, um, you know, an antihistamine. It's good. I like antihistamines. Um, and then um, I want to make sure the route is appropriate too, because remember with anaphylaxis, we want to be careful with what route we're giving them their medications because they have this closed airway issue. So IV push, that's the appropriate route. So I don't see anything that's contraindicated about this. And I don't think, see anything that's unnecessary about this because this can help me to get to the bottom of my problem. So I'm going to say a, yes, it is appropriate. Last but not least, we have a regular diet. So, hmm, you know, this is one of those times, and again, with all of these, and I'm sorry, I really didn't teach this in the beginning, with all these, you should just sit there and be like, okay, is it going to help? Yes or no? Regular diet, well, they need nutrition, yes, yeah, so it could help. Is there anything this could do to harm the patient? Well, this patient has an airway closure problem. If I give them a regular diet, they could end up aspirating or have other issues because they have an airway issue. And most likely anyway, they're probably, they're like I mentioned, they're probably gonna be intubated. So this is probably not appropriate. Um, so I would probably, um, you know, even let's say that the patient is not intubated, um, you know, a regular diet as a whole in the sense that this patient has an impending closing airway, um, you know, my focus really isn't on, let me make sure that they have a regular diet or that they're taking in um, regular foods and things like that. Uh, really, this is an ABC problem. So um, it's not that it's unnecessary, but I would say it's more C contraindicated because, um, you know, I don't want a patient who could impending have a closing airway need to be intubated or may need additional procedures to have that risk for aspiration or have like a full belly of food. Um, so um, with these, like I said, you, what do you want to think about is, is it helpful? Like, is this actually going to advance this patient's care or do something to directly treat or help manage it? Um, is there anything that can, is it, can it cause harm in any way to this patient um, when it comes to like, you know, um, going against all of our goals or what we're trying to obtain or get to, or, and does it actually have anything to do with it? Will it actually advance their care? That's really when you're trying to look at a question like this, what you're trying to differentiate. So hopefully that helped to break down problems like this. We'll do more in the future. 
So now let's talk about oxygen. Um, so patients with anaphylaxis are also going to commonly be on oxygen. Like I said, it's kind of a, you know, a gimme. You have to, you know, if your airway is closing, even if we open your airway, you're probably going to need some supplemental oxygen because there's a period of time usually where your body's not getting enough oxygen. So it's usually going to need some support. So these help to increase your oxygen levels and decrease the symptoms of shortness of breath, dyspnea. Um, a lot of people can use oxygen. This is just one of many people we will talk about that may require oxygen therapy. Um, we use devices to give additional oxygen. Like right now in this room that I'm in and whatever room you're in, it's going to be around 21% oxygen. And that's enough for most of us to breathe without any issues or out in the world, 21% oxygen. Um, but um, a few things to keep in mind with oxygen therapy is, is that you do need a prescription. Remember prescription and order are synonymous, but you need to have a prescription in order to apply oxygen. You can't just go around applying it. Um, you know, especially on a nursing school exam, you always have to have an order. Um, you want the least invasive therapy possible. So I do not want extra oxygen. There is oxygen toxicity. It's not common, et cetera, but it can happen. So you always want to, you know, have the least amount of oxygen as possible, especially for some patients like COPD patients. This is so key. You always want the least amount that you can get um, to get the um, best outcome. Um, we want to consider how uh, these the oxygen therapy can affect communication and nutrition. They can create barriers for communication and nutrition. So you always want to consider which one is going to be best for your patient, but also promote good communication and adequate nutrition. Um, within the prescription, we're going to have directions to titrate and we usually titrate per their oxygen saturation. So if I go into a patient's room and they're on four liters nasal cannula and they're at a hundred percent, you know, I'm looking to turn that down because they don't need to be at a hundred percent. Um, so if I can get them down to two liters or get that turned off, that's great. So, you know, I should always be looking at, um, their oxygen saturation and see if I can titrate down on that or get them off of that oxygen if they don't need it. Um, you know, keep in mind, there are sometimes, um, you know, we don't talk about them all this semester, but there are sometimes that we, even if a patient's at 100, we want to hyper oxygenate or give them more oxygenation. Um, like when someone's having a heart attack or other things, they might need extra oxygenation. So, um, but we'll talk about those, but just know in general, um, we like to, you know, keep people on the least amount of oxygen as possible. Cause again, it's, um, if it's unnecessary and then there's uh, complications from wearing devices like this, we always like to think about those. And then, um, and one of those complications, like I was just mentioning about is like skin breakdown as well. So I need to watch their skin closely. So let's talk about the different types of oxygen that we can use. Um, nasal cannula is probably the one of the ones you'll see most often. It's one of the most least invasive oxygen therapies, most commonly used ones. Um, the minimum that we can put a patient on is one liter, which is um, equals to about 24%. Remember the you know, uh, atmosphere is about 21%. So it gives you just a little bit more uh, bump of oxygen. The maximum for nasal cannula you can put someone on is six liters. After that, it becomes high flow um, nasal cannula, but um, you know, six liters is about 44% oxygen. Um, the nice thing about this, patient can eat, talk, and cough freely. Um, there are potential issues they can have. They can get dry in their nose. Um, we, we can do things like add humidity. There's uh, you know, this little, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, I want to call it a box, but it's like a little container of water that gets attached to your, um, uh, what do you call it? A flow meter. And it helps to add humidity because, you know, normally your nose adds humidity to oxygen like you take a deep breath in, your nose has, um, you know, uh, certain capabilities to actually humidify the oxygen as it's going into your body. Now, if you put the nasal cannula in, you're bypassing where that humidification happens. Um, so it can lead to dryness. So you definitely want to add humidity. A lot of patients can complain about this. So, um, you know, I always just try to keep in mind, like one of the first things I do when I'm assessing my patients is I'm going and I'm looking, I'm like, okay, wait, do they have that, um, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, humidity added? And this is usually not something um, that you ever have to like get an order for or anything like that. It's something that we can just add as a part of their oxygen setup. Um, then we're also, there can be breakdown at skin, pressure points like here on the cheeks, around the ears. So a lot of these come with ear protectors. And then sometimes I'll put like gauze or other things on here in their face, especially if they're um, getting pressure. So um, monitor their skin closely and apply protectors where you can. There's also high flow nasal cannula. Um, this can deliver close to 100% oxygen. It also provides flow or like a push. So, you know, sometimes 
um, people, we can give them oxygen, but if they're having trouble getting like volume in, or if they're having trouble, like their lungs aren't very strong, they sometimes need a little push from like the outside atmosphere to push it into their lungs. And this is what this does. So when I, like I had a patient the other day that was on this. So when you go and get report, they'll tell you they're on this percent, this much flow. So I had a patient who was on 50% and then 50 liters of flow or 50 liters of push. And so it's how much push that helps to um, get that oxygen in. Um, the, the thing about this is it's more comfortable, has more flexible tubing. It's automatically humidified. Um, but the one thing you want to keep in mind is a lot of patients with this can complain of feeling hot because it feels really warm to them. Um, but it really helps, especially with the amount of flow and high levels of oxygen they're getting with this. It has to be humidified. Like there's no ifs, ands, or buts around it. So patients do complain of it being hot. I think there is a thermometer or things that, that can slightly be adjusted on it. But I'll just tell you, a lot of patients will complain about that and want to take it off. Um, it has the same consent skin considerations as the regular nasal cannula. And um, you can't, uh, the one thing, the other thing to consider is that you can't transport on this. You usually have to switch them to a non-rebreather um, in the meantime, if you have to transport. So just make sure, um, you know, know that this is not like a regular nasal cannula. This gives a lot more. So like, you know, like some patients, their nasal cannula, they want to go to the bathroom real quick. They take it off and go to the bathroom. This is not something that they just like, oh, I'm going to just take off my high flow real quick. This is a lot of oxygen. So if a patient's on this, usually Usually they're going to be more bed bound um, or they're, um, you know, they're not going to be as mobile ambulatory. They're needing more support. So just keep it in mind. This is something that you want to keep a close eye. This is a lot more support for a patient. Um, so this kind of shows you, um, this is just one um, device, but it tells you like here, like I said, with the high flow, you have how much oxygen they're on and then how much flow they're on, like how much push. Um, so you're going to want to look at that. Every hospital is a little different how it might look. And then this is what a nasal cannula um, you know, a flow meter looks like, and I mean, this is not, I shouldn't say this is a nasal cannula flow meter because this is just a flow meter, but, um, this is what, um, you know, this is a flow meter It's all your oxygen is going to be hooked up to this. Um, some people, um, some hospitals have these Christmas trees. I know the hospital that I worked, uh, work for now, um, doesn't use them anymore. We just directly connect the oxygen tubing there. Um, but some still do, but you would want to know as a nurse, how to read these flow meters. So like, for example, here, um, I'm, this patient is on four four liters of oxygen. So you can kind of see like they have markings in between for one and a half, two and a half. And so you want to see where the ball rests, where the ball is kind of in the center. So this is like about four liters of oxygen. Um, and so you always want to know. So for example, um, you know, on a exam or something like that, we could give you a picture of a flow meter and say like, hey, you know, what oxygen are they probably on? If it's less than six liters, it should be nasal cannula. This is a high flow. So this the one here to the left is a high flow. It cannot be a regular nasal cannula. Less than six liters, it's going to be um, nasal cannula. Now, if this is above six liters, um, it's some sort of high flow, or if it's all the way up at 15, it's probably a mask or a non-rebreather is attached. So um, you should be able to look at a flow meter and be able to tell kind of what oxygen your patient should be on. Now, just because this oxygen's here doesn't mean that it can really work effectively. There is stuff like with devices, like you think, oh, I could put a nasal cannula on and put them on 15 liters. It doesn't really work that way. Um, you know, there, there's certain things that have to happen where these devices only work effectively at certain, you know, levels. So in other words, like I'm saying, so you want to say nasal cannula, if I'm getting up to six, I need to be looking at advancing them to a high flow or a mask or something else. Um, so as a nurse, you should always check your flow meter and then always check from the patient. Cause a lot of times these nasal cannulas can end up on the cheek and it's oxygenating their cheeks, not actually in their nose, make sure both of the cannulas are in their nose. And then I follow it all the way to the device and make sure that they're actually getting flow. I usually take Take it out for a second and make sure I can either hear or feel um, oxygen going in, or I'll check with them, make sure that they feel that oxygen going in. And then I'm always checking this because sometimes um, respiratory therapists or doctors can go in and change this too. So I always want to keep an eye on uh, what oxygen levels they're on. So there's also oxygen delivered via mass. Um, with masks, these can provide higher concentrations of oxygen. Um, you know, some considerations is they have more pieces or um, they may require assembly. Um, you know, so just keep in mind, these aren't maybe as simple as like the nasal cannula, which just has one piece. You just have to get it in the nose. Um, they can be harder to keep clean. They cover the whole mouth. So the mouth is a very dirty place. Not that the nose is perfectly clean, but um, definitely there's a lot more uh, barriers there. 
Um, it creates more nutrition or communication barriers. So you have to keep that in mind. And there can be skin breakdown around the mask, just like the nasal cannula. So there's a couple different masks. And of course, there's I'm sure there's more out there than this, but these are going to be some of the most common that you hear talked about on exams that you see in live. So there's what's called a simple face mask. This can give between about 30 to 35 to 50 percent oxygen. Um, there's a Venturi mask or a Venti mask. This can give very precise concentrations of oxygen. So the cool thing about this, um, I'll show it on the next slide, is it has these little pieces that like, let's say I want to give a very precise certain amount of oxygen. This is great for people that I don't want to have too much oxygen, like COPD patients. Um, I can give this to them um, and place this where they're going to have a very precise concentration of oxygen. Um, and so I'll show you, it'll make more sense when I show you the pictures, but effectively, if I say like, I want to give them exactly 30 something percent oxygen, then um, this allows for that. It does take more assembly. You have to get the right um, pieces and stuff together for that. And then there's a non-rebreather, um, which can give almost hundred percent oxygen, but there's a bag attached to the non-rebreather. That bag always must remain inflated. So Here's a simple face mask in this upper right over here. Um, you can see it's just a mask and you just put it over the head. But again, communication barriers, nutrition barriers, et cetera. And then over here, this is a venti mask. So you can see all these colored pieces. These colored pieces are the different concentrations. So you can see you attach them here to this piece. You need to make sure you're putting in the right um, one. So if the doctor orders a very precise concentration of oxygen, again, this might be something for like a COPD patient where we don't want them to have too much oxygen. It'll make more sense when I go over my COPD stuff. Um, then we also have um, this beautiful gal over here in the lower right who's wearing her um, non-rebreather. So you can see here this bag here, it's a, um, the, well, it's called a non-rebreather. Um, it's uh, this, this bag that's attached to the mask. It has to stay inflated. If it's not inflated, it's not actually working the way that it's supposed to and giving them the correct amount of oxygen. So with masks like this, we turn this up to that 15 liters on the um, on the flow meter, going back here, the flow meter, we turn it all the way up to 15 and, um, it allows, this also is great for like transport when they're on that high flow nasal cannula and stuff like that, but it gives very good oxygenation. Um, so this is, if you're ever like in a crisis and your patient's not breathing well, like let's say we're waiting to intubate a patient who's in anaphylaxis. This is a lot of times what they're going to be on is a non rebreather, um, just to make sure that we are, um, giving them enough, like hundred percent oxygen until we can, uh, get the airway open with a breathing tube. Um, but you can see obviously there the there's more places for the skin that the, the mask is touching the skin that could lead to breakdown. So keep a close eye on their skin, support good communication, nutrition. Um, there are times that sometimes they can take this off for a quick second to take a sip of water, but always look at your doctor's orders and make sure what's appropriate. Because sometimes what I'll do first is I'll kind of take it off for a second and see, because some patients you barely like lift it up and they are dropping their oxygen saturation. So um, if someone's about to actively get intubated, it's not a time to be giving them water. But I mean, if someone needs to more long-term be on a mask or need more oxygen support, there may be times where they can, you know, take a quick sip of water and stuff. But always think about what's appropriate, especially if someone's having an airway issue going on and um is and or is high risk for aspiration so last not least two um <clears throat> uh sum it up let's talk about um you know what is my role as the nurse for a patient with anaphylaxis we've talked about kind of bring it together because i know we kind of got off a little bit off topic, we talked about some meds for um, like uh, inhaled corticosteroids, inhaled short acting beta agonists like albuterol. Um, we talked about oxygen therapy, which are all possible treatments for anaphylaxis. But what, is, what am I doing as the nurse? Um, my main focus is watching that airway and watching their breathing cl uh, closely. You know, think back to all those priority assessments we talked about before. I'm going to check their vital signs regularly and look for shock. Um, you know, again, I'm going to be looking for a low blood pressure, high heart rate there. Um, keep their head a bit elevated as long as their blood pressure is not too low um, because we want to make sure that we're supporting a good patent airway. And it's easier for your body to, um, your lungs to expand and to breathe better when you're sitting more upright. And then general teaching for anaphy anaphylaxis is to avoid the allergens, especially if you know you have an anaphylactic reaction. You may need to wear a medic alert bracelet, et cetera, to let people know if it is something that you have a problem with. Um, take medications regularly for optimal results and prior to exposure. So if you're on anything like, you know, 
Um, it, I'm not talking about taking epinephrine. Remember, we only take epinephrine to treat, but um, if you know like that you have bad allergies to things, it's better to try to take medications to suppress that immune response prior. If you have an anaphylactic allergy, you have to 100% avoid those things. There's no like ifs, ands, or buts. There's no medication you can take to necessarily fully prevent anaphylaxis, but there are things that you can do to prevent an allergic reaction that could get really bad that could lead to anaphylaxis. Um, and then, you know, just knowing how to manage reactions at home. So this would go back to all the hypersensitivity. We stuff talk about EpiPen education, making sure the family is educated on all that stuff. And you can review that in my last PowerPoint if that helps. So next we're going to do a quick short, um, I'm not going to do it in this video, but next will be latex allergies. And then we're getting into some sinusitis and some influenza. So fun stuff to come. Hope this helped. See you for the next one.